Um, I now want to move on to the non-Duma part of the talk. Um, and I want to start with a quote where I'm turning to you. So here's another question to you folks. There's a quote that's been doing the rounds where I just cannot find the attribution and neither ChatGPT nor Google is helping me. And it could be because I'm lame or it could be because some things are hard to find. But there's a quote in the context of AI that says, we have all been promoted. Meaning everybody's a boss now. Everybody's a manager. So the, the, uh, the one way to look at one way to look at AI in the modern workplace is that we've all been, all been promoted. Now, why do I have a string of Corellas sitting on a, on a power line as, a, as, a, as an illustration of we have all been promoted? I have no idea. But I took that picture uh, this morning. Um, so uh, my theme for the next few slides is that we, we have all, for better or for worse, been promoted. We all, we've all acquired a kind of employee, a potential employee, um, perhaps. Uh, if we want to turn this more into a question and statement is, we're now, I'm just wondering, is AI more like a tool or is it more like an employee? And this gets closer to this topic of humanizing AI. Um, and again, again, it's not that I have a strong opinion here, it's that it's not that my opinion is strongly it's it's an, an employee, nor is it that it's still a very much a tool. My point is that it definitely got blurrier three years ago. But three years ago, it was clearly more like a tool than it is now. It's one of those. It's debatable, but it, and it's uh, and it's much more debatable now than it used to be. Um, maybe it's both like a tool and an employee, but. This is where I want to turn the tables around and ask, well, are people things for us always like employees? And I would propose for you what I would refer to as an employee continuum. So I would say that, yes, if you're dealing with someone who's a senior executive of a very large company and you're maybe one, one tier of the org chart above them, yeah, very much in the employee. And indeed, any senior in the company, maybe all the way down to someone who's uh, an on-site permanent. But at the other extreme, um, who's aware of Amazon Mechanical Turk? Now, the interesting thing about Amazon Mechanical Turk is that it, it completely, what's the right word for it, mechanizes human activity, doesn't it? Amazon Turk is is the place where, and this sounds pretty horrible, right? But it works out not too badly for the people involved. It's a way of mechanizing human activity. So it's actually humans doing the work, but your interface to those humans is like your interface with code. Also, also moving up the chain, how many of you have used Upwork? Now, you can use Upwork two ways. I mean, Upwork is, a, is an, uh, basically a uh, distance work freelancing website. You can use it two ways. You can use it as someone who has people working for them, or you can be an employee on Upwork. So has anyone been an employee, uh, a worker on Upwork? Has anyone used people on Upwork? Because I've, I've used plenty. Um, so again, Upwork is... Um, It's not exactly like using a tool, but as I'll probably mention more later, I found using using uh, LLMs for doing serious stuff not very different than getting people on Upwork to do things for me. In fact, I found I found LLMs dare I say more responsive and more human <laughs> than a lot of Upworkers. Now, AIs have problems. AIs have serious problems. AIs can hallucinate. AIs can say inappropriate and unpleasant things, mean things. AIs could even do dangerous things. AIs can make mistakes. And AIs may be misaligned, which is a, a way of saying they may not have your best interests at heart. They may not be, they may not have the intentions you want them to have. I just read the 
and I'm going to change my answer. They're very much like humans already there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because that was the question. <laughs> because the, the question is, can you think of another class of potentially sentient agent, and I say potentially, mm -hmm. um, who also has these characteristics. And yeah, Warwick, thank you. <laughs> thank you for going to the heart of my rhetorical question. Um, I'd say in their failure modes, in their, in their failure modes, I would suggest that AIs are much more like people than say uh, the R or Python code you wrote recently is, or the, um, or the uh, CRM system you set up, or any any piece of IT you've launched lately. IT doesn't fail the way AI fails, but AI fails, I would suggest, in ways very, very similar to people. Um, and back to who the, it might remind me of, um, here's a conversation. So we're now getting closer to the various examples and conversations that I possibly should have started with, but I think it felt more natural to kind of wind down with. Um, so I was talking to one of my AI skeptical friends and my AI skeptical friend said, yeah, well, you know, uh, it's like, it's like, a, a barely performing mediocre employee. And I said, yeah, it's like a barely performing a mediocre employee who is able to perform at a professional level in just about every profession where text is involved. Um, and do it at scale and do it without sick days and other breaks in productivity. Also, that mediocre employee was even more mediocre several months ago. It's getting smarter. What's it going to be like in a few more months? What's it going to be like in a few more years? Um, so um, in, its, in its failure mode, I would say where AI doesn't perform to scratch, we want AI to be a star employee. And I think it's comparable. I mean, back to the Odesk example in particular, the Upwork example, up, Odesk rebranded as Upwork. I'm still getting too confused. Uh, to back to the Upwork example, I find that, um, yeah, uh, the, the problems, the frustrations, the, um, the mistakes, the blind alleys that I see with, uh, uh, with, with LLMs are very, very, very similar to what I experience in dealing with um, Upworkers and also my techniques for managing them are very similar. So uh, AI has problems too. And yeah, uh, I jumped the gun a bit. Um, by the way, that is me growing my avocado from seed, which I like to do. Um, but the, the cute thing is that not only is there a big stem, but it's actually grown a little stem. And that, yeah, I'm very happy. Avocados are producing little stems for the first time. Um, so, you know, if we look at how AIs fail, do they fail like animals? Do they fail like the kind of AI machine learning we had before LLMs came along? Does it fail like the kind of tech or code we, we have when we're not even talking about AI or ML? Um, or, or do they fail primarily in the same way as people? And do they necessitate a management, a, a care, a handling, a risk man management, similar to what people do? So could we say that even in failure, AIs are more similar to humans than either of the two AIs and humans are to any other class of agent? And when I say any other class of agent, I mean anything else halfway smart that you might write, any other kind of ML type system you might write, or indeed animals, you know, chimpanzees, uh, what, what else is clever? Chimpanzees, dolphins, uh, New Caledonian crows, I believe, are very, very smart. Um, what else can we compare AI to? And that's an open question. That's, uh, if you can give me another basis for comparison, I'm, I'm all ears. Um, so if we see that similarity, if you agree that there's a similarity, can we also say that we manage AI in its failure? By the way, <laughs> most management management from failure aren't we just don't we just let successful things get on with it so in managing it's in failure which is to say in managing it uh can we see that perhaps we manage it more like a problematic employee and less like we manage a broken it system this is possibly the one slide you needed to see and not come to this talk this is probably the core argument of this talk by the way um I would say, yeah, if there's one, if there's one slide that is not me making uh, 
making bad puns and showing you pictures of cats. It's, it's this one. Um, and if we were to talk about the emerging user interface, I don't think we're there yet, but if we're talking about the emerging user interface of AI, is it perhaps something akin to whatever is the user interface of an imperfect human employee? So this is where I found myself talking about the human user interface. Now, I didn't, I didn't coin this term. I didn't go, hey, let's come up with a handy term. I was actually just having a conversation, talking about actually uh, re-engineering a business and re-engineering it with LLMs and replacing or scaling, rather, not replacing, but scaling human employees um, with, uh, with LLM capability. And the sort of questions I was being asked, I'll get to that example later, we'll talk more about it. The sort of questions that I was being asked, I go, no, no, stop thinking about IT. Let's talk about the business. Let's talk about the employees. And let's talk about the sort of ways we manage those because we're going to be managing the AI in roughly the same way. And when I got pushed back, I said, well, what, what, you know, what, like, well, what's the user interface? I go, well, what's the user interface of the employees? And more on this later. Maybe, maybe there'll be a few more equally important slides. So let's talk about this human, human user interface. Okay, I think this slide is probably useful as well if you found the last one useful. The point about the human user interface is first of all, it's iterative, it's exploratory. See, unlike Python code, unlike cloud systems, humans get things wrong and they get things wrong in unpredictable ways. The other thing is, Unlike Python code, the way we instruct people is never complete. There's always a little bit of faith. There's always a little bit of uncertainty. There's always a little bit of incompleteness in how we instruct. Um, and we expect errors, and we expect to manage those errors. The fact that the instructions are natural language is the duh, obvious um, analogy with, uh, with, it, with, with LLMs. And there's an assumption that whoever you're instructing has a degree of innate intuition, and it's not an innate intuition that you can fully understand, the way you can usually fully understand the input-output capabilities of, a, of, a, of an IT system. Um, you assume a degree of innate intuition on the part of the recipient. Uh, you always see that assumption violated. <laughs> whatever intuition you assume, whatever capability you assume, you're going to be disappointed. Humans get things wrong. Who makes mistakes? I do, all the time, all the time. And especially relative to someone else's expectations. Certainly, certainly by my own, and even more so by the expectations of others. Um, so the assumption is always violated, and this requires further iteration. Now, hopefully, in a good world, the recipient, the human, or the AI, the agent that you're getting to do work for you, hopefully learns and hopefully improves. Or you learn and get better at instructing them. So both things happen. The point is, what I'm just, what I'm just, am I, am I describing something inc incredibly complex and new, or am I describing what human beings have done for the last ten thousand years since the advent of agriculture? Um, I'd say, I'd say it's the latter. Only now, I'm talking about it in the context of working with technology. We've never worked with technology like this. Now, I saw here's another. Quote, and this time, not only is my quote um, uncredited, it's also paraphrased. I don't remember the exact quote. I saw it in a tweet. I didn't save it. If anybody can find it and anybody can uh, give me the attribution, I'll be very grateful. But it was something along the lines of that the age of the engineer has ended and the age of the researcher has begun. That until, until however many months or years ago, being an engineer, being someone who builds stuff, made you valuable. Okay, and, and yes, those are still valuable, but suddenly the people who can explore, the people who can tinker, the people who can interact, the people who are comfortable with uncertainty and will experiment and risk as part of their job and deal with extreme uncertainty, they're the ones in demand. And I say that because uh, that's what it takes to work with AI and with human beings. To be a manager is to deal with uncertainty. You never know exactly who you're dealing with. You never know exactly how to instruct them. You never know exactly what's enough. You have to try. Trying may be risky. There could be blowback. You need to minimize that risk and you still need, need to do. 
need to do this. So working with modern AI is much more tentative, much more iterative, much more experimental, and much more inherently risky, but acceptably risky, otherwise we wouldn't do it. So there is such a thing as acceptable risk um, in most cases. Now, does this, does this make you think more of IT systems of the last 50 odd years? Or does this make you think of people? Um, the other open question is, uh, how can we improve on how we relate to AI so we get the best of both worlds? I mean, is there a way of relating to AI that improves on how we relate to people, takes advantage of the fact that, yes, AI is still a technology? Well, maybe that maybe there'll be, maybe there'll be some sort of hybrid approach, maybe things like Langchain already getting us there. I don't know. But uh, I still think, the reason, okay, let's talk about why I'm telling you this, because maybe you're all thinking, yeah, but this is obvious. Yeah. Okay, well, if it's obvious to you, that's fantastic. I find this is not obvious to most people. And what's interesting to me is, particularly with a lot of IT background people working with AI, they're working with AI as if it's code. They're not working with AI like this at all. So are there people not doing this? Yes, there are. Um, oh, but if you also think this is nonsense and we shouldn't even be thinking about this, and I'd like to hear from you. And you may be right. So um, when we consider how to interface with an AI in a business context, uh, what processes to embed in it, how to instruct it, what data to feed it, how to treat its output, as well as how to correct its behavior. Um, I'm paraphrasing what I said before. It may serve you well to consider first and foremost how you do the same things with people, how you interface with people, how you instruct people, how you feed data to people, how you assess the, the metrics of the output of people. That's the human user interface, folks. Um, maybe the natural AI user interface is something like that. Maybe it's approaching that. Or as I said, maybe it'll be some sort of hybrid of that and uh, the sort of the more sort of uh, deterministic uh, deterministic code-based approach that uh, everybody seems to feel much more comfortable with. Now that picture, I'm very proud of that. I also took today. Um, if anybody, if anybody is interested, um, that is the largest tortoise. Technically, it's a tortoise and not a turtle, but hey, no one says tortoise. Everyone says turtle. Agreed? We're all allowed to say turtle, even though it's actually a tortoise. That is the largest turtle. Turtle. <laughs> that is the largest turtle. I've ever seen in the wild. It's about this big. And I took the photo today. Um, this is the second time I've seen him and taken a photo of him. By the way, I'm assuming it's a him. I'm sorry to use gender turtles. <laughs> um, uh, this turtle is um, lives in Cooper Park. And at about, by about 10 o'clock, it's usually sunning they self um, <laughs> on a rock um, near where I usually have coffee after I brought my son off to school. So, um, yeah, highly recommended. Um, Hi. Huh? What is it? It's a turtle. I know what kind. Uh, the, the, the shell kind. <laughs> <laughs> I just was curious. I'm, I'm not a turtle tissue. Turtle I tissue. Turtle. I grew up, we had snappers that were like that. Like that. Well, <laughs> as, as I wrote to my friend, it's bigger than anything I've seen in the wild except for sea turtles in Bali. So that's about as technical as I get, right? Um, but yes, uh, well, well worth uh, well worth the visit. Cooper Park, near, right near the tennis courts, there's a cafe, and right near the cafe, there's a creek. And yeah, so, um, so with this human interface, uh, yeah, I'm 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 interested. This open question to you is: Do you find the idea obvious? Do you find the idea ridiculous? Do you find the idea new and interesting? I'm yeah, interested to hear what you think. Um, so, uh, so the, 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 the speaking more about the human user interface, the basic organizing principles, you have, you have objectives, you have data, you have uh, other process inputs. In fact, you have instructions. Um, you have their mode of digestion, um, and these are all informed partially or vaguely, as they will be with humans. That's what we do with our labs, uh, and we may we probably do need to iterate to arrive at something useful. If you don't have, if you don't have iteration, um, and by the way, there, there's there's the completely different conversation of well, who does the managing and who does the iteration? Um, maybe this is another talk. Well, what if the management layer is also done by an AI? 
why can't the management layer be a, a, an AI? Or how many management layers do you have to go before it must be human and why? That's, that's a big conversation. Again, yeah, we find this idea obvious, which was, I don't know. Um, look, we're, we're getting towards the end. Uh, how are we doing for time, by the way? Um, I wanted, I could have started with this. I could have started with this, but, uh, uh, and by the way, input from you folks as well. I, I probably will do this talk again. Uh, maybe I should start with the next few slides because these are kind of my inspirations uh, that led to this, this whole conversation. Um, and these are a few use cases and a few um, episodes in my own working life that led me to think down this path. And the first one is just this conversation about AI for small business. So the matter at hand was, well, there is a group of small businesses and the opportunity is to use AI to yeah, make things better. And what I found was that the conversation drifted towards, well, what is the data and uh, you know, what, what targets can be identified, sort of old school ML kind of conversation. Um, you know, talking about models, talking about objective functions, talking about use cases, you know, attention, uh, customer uh, customer acquisition, customer retention, maybe risk of some kind, you know, the usual the usual uh, predictive modeling type challenges, but for a small business, real challenges, right? Because we're not talking about millions of uh, millions of customers and we may not be talking about the, you know, the kind of service business where uh, where uh, those sort of predictive models tend to shine. Um, and I sort of looked at everyone, I said, well, why aren't we actually asking what are the junior employees of the business doing and could the business do more of it at scale? Because that's really the, the natural opportunity for AI 2.0 of an LLM. So, uh, and uh, yeah, what, what, what confused me was that it confused everyone else. What confused me was that uh, there was even any need to talk about the other kind of ML. Um, so I conceived of AI uh, in this case as a junior employee. Um, and I conceived that the clear opportunity for any small business, um, for any business at all, is for AI to scale junior employees, um, to scale uh, the semi-repeatable tasks um, that, that are well enough defined and suddenly within reach. Um, yeah, uh, so one of, the, one of the inspirations for this talk was that what I thought was obvious to me was not obvious to other people. Um, and I found myself having to talk talk past layers of, well, what is the data? Uh, what are the features? Uh, what is the target? I'm going, no, 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 it's not about that at all. We're missing the point completely. Um, um, see you work. Um, and uh, I was actually much more interested in what the legacy business model was than I was in what I usually, and for decades I've been interested in as a machine learning professional as a data scientist, as someone who's interested in what are the data sources, what are features, what are the targets, what are the error measures, and does it, does it fit nicely into one of the use cases of, of acquisition, retention, risk, fraud, whatever. Um, yeah, so the way I think about AI has changed completely for this reason, and yeah, I was a bit surprised that others hadn't joined me in that. Um, um, now, in a completely different situation, um, this is something else I'm involved in, so it's a tech startup. And this tech startup has, again, a lot of human semi-repeatable work. And actually the human semi-repeatable work in this case needs to be pretty smart semi-repeatable work, but it's still human and it is semi-repeatable and it does need to scale. Um, and they need reliable, affordable and capable junior staff. And finding reliable, affordable and capable junior staff is always a problem, um, especially when you're trying to grow and, you know, Taking them on is a risk, not taking them on is a risk. Uh, you need to be able to train them quickly. Uh, you need to be onboarded. You need, you need to onboard them and it needs to be a success and you need to make sure there's enough uh, work to justify it. So there's every single reason to at least supplement, supplement that sort of business model with AI if you can. But, um, and by the way, if, if, there was one, if there was one inspiration for this talk, Specifically, it was this this particular use case, and I think it's in this in in, in this use case conversation that the issue of the human uh, the human user interface came up for me, in, partly in frustration, because the questions were being I was being asked as well. What's the data? 
uh, what's the model, what's the schema? Um, and I'm going, let's treat it like we treat people. Let's, let's just plan it the way we plan it. How do we, what do we do with breaks? Well, what do you do for human breaks? <laughs> Our humans keep breaking all the time. <laughs> we, know, we know what to do there. Um, it's, it's roughly the same. Um, so yeah, what I found was that I, for some, whatever reason, had a much more intuitively human-centric view of how AI comes into the picture than the other people did. So what I discovered was that there is a gap in the market for uh, just presenting this view because it's not obvious for everyone, which is why I'm giving this talk. Um, now this slide, um, I, I have already credited Luke Metcalf, who has presented to this forum more than once and who is uh, an outstanding data scientist and entrepreneur with, with his business microverbs. And uh, a lot of uh, a lot of what what you see here, I think, was inspired by my ongoing very interesting conversations with Luke. Um, and Luke is also probably the most serious business user of AI that I know. Um, he it's he makes no secret of the fact that it's you know automating and scaling his business. And uh, yes, he has human employees and he hires humans. So he's not, he's not in the business of replacing people, but he's certainly in the business of augmenting them. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, to him, AI is basically an employee. He thinks of AI in a very human way um, as compared with some others. Um, now, interestingly, Luke is also the one who introduced me to Upwork many years ago. And I'm still contemplating the analogies between yeah, the mechanical Turk upworld way of working with humans, and the well, the uh, the way we work with uh, with LLMs, as compared with the way we work with humans in a more sort of uh, on-site, direct, permanent employee manner. And by the way, speaking of upwork, I think there's an, this is an aside, but for those who think there's a bit too much AI doomerism going on, just in terms of everybody losing their jobs. There's a very interesting counter argument to everybody's going to lose their jobs to AI, even if we live in a world where, frankly, everybody could and should lose their jobs to AI, if we're talking just in terms of AI capability. And, what, and why? Because Upwork, I found as an entrepreneur, incredibly useful, incredibly handy. And the mystery to me, which, which uh, persists to this day, is why I haven't come across a single enterprise that uses Upwork at all, let alone at any given scale. I've, I thought if economics work properly, there will come a point where there's an Upwork apocalypse and all the Upworkers are, are employed by the corporates. Now, now we can talk about why I was wrong. I have some, in, I have some theories. I'm frankly not sure about my theories, especially because I was wrong in the first place about it, it, it not happening at all. But my point is, is just because something looks like it's a good idea and something looks like it's an inevitable consequence of you know, the way economic efficiencies work, doesn't mean things work out that way. So just like corporations didn't adopt Upwork, even though by all logic they could have, maybe corporations and governments won't adopt LLMs, even as LLMs might even have the, 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 the non-theoretical capability to replace people. So just a thought. Just a thought. Uh, human, uh, human irrationality at, at, at scale knows no bounds. So have faith in it. Um, now, those are tawny frog mounts. Now, what are tawny frog mounts? The, the most the, the native Australian birds are about this big. They live in pairs. They're nocturnal and they're not owls. And the reason I tell you they're not owls is because they look like owls. Okay. So just like that turtle was a turtle, tawny frog mounts are owls. Okay. <laughs> Technically, no, but. I don't think there's any ornithologist listening, so you can call them owls if you really want. I won't dob you in. Um, and I saw two of them sleeping happily uh, on a pipe outside of a four or five story building, very close to Wendy's Secret Garden on, in North Sydney. Um, I came back there a month later with my son. I, I showed them, my son was over the moon about these tawny frog mounts. Yeah, they sleep during the day, that's them asleep. Um, yeah, they weren't there. Uh, a month later, unfortunately. But uh, what has that got to do with real, real world inspiration? Three and personal use cases? Nothing, right? So <laughs> the other pictures, but I like 20 frog mouse. Um, this is a very small, I'm, I'm now going into the smaller use cases. Now, on the way to the Kung Fu class on Friday, I went with a fellow, a very interesting fellow. He's actually uh, 
the European champion of an MMA category called Shuto. A very capable guy, a good fighter. But he's also, he's an interesting chap, he's actually also got a degree in philosophy. And we just started talking about GPT-3. Now, he is German, so this may, be, may have been a language thing. Um, from your neck of the woods, baby, he's from around Frankfurt. Oh. Um, and uh, yeah, and I said, well, yeah, yeah. So do you use chat GPT? He says, yeah, yeah, I talked to him. Mm. And he was just talking about chat GPT as a, as a him. So yeah, I, I don't want to get into the whole gender thing here, but um, the point is he was referring to chat GPT as a person, which I found fascinating. And I said, you, you realize you're talking about chat GPT as a person? Yeah, he said, yeah, yeah, I do. That, that's pretty weird, isn't it? So that sort of stuff does happen. So when you're talking about humanizing AI, well, people do. Um, I also, also want to- got Elixir and Siri, so it's quite normal now. Siri's horrible. <laughs> um, I also want to talk about the various use cases that many of us are putting um, AI to. Um, the obvious one, the simplest one, is that it's a search engine on steroids, right? So um, I don't know if, how many of you remember the launch of Wolfram Alpha? But Wolfram Alpha, when it was launched, hyped a theoretical ability to basically intuitively answer, uh, answer natural language questions, which, by, in my opinion, it actually failed to do. It was okay. It was, you know, it was good for what it did, but it couldn't reach that. It seems to me that ChatGPT achieved and massively exceeded the expectation of Wolfram Alpha. So it's a search engine on steroids. I do not. Actually, no, I tell you, I still use DuckDuckGo occasionally, mostly out of habit and laziness, to be honest with you. Um, but uh, just like I still use for loops instead of map functions, you know, but, um, you know, it's just laziness, you know, you know what's better. But, yeah. but uh, it's a search engine on steroids. And by the way, that that's a continuum there because it's not just a search engine on steroids, it's an oracle. So I don't just use it as a search engine. I actually ask it questions. I, I ask it for... Uh, explanation i ask it sometimes you know it can produce, how many of you have used it to produce nice tabular output so i was interested in what kinds of fertilizer i need for different plants in my garden how often i should apply it um, what uh, what what uh, the different mixes of uh, what, what is it nitrogen phosphorus and uranium <laughs> don't give uranium to your plants um, uh, the, the, it, it produced the tables for me it was great so you can use, and, and by the way, when I say Oracle, people use it for medical advice. People use it for legal advice. I mean, I'm not saying you should. I'm wondering what, I, I'm wondering if it's a felony to suggest you should. It's a US thing. No, no, no. Anyway, um, the point is, yeah, don't, don't, don't get your medical or legal advice from an AI. But the point is people do, uh, rightly or wrongly. And of course, how many people here have used um, uh, an LLM for coding purposes? to write code, to explain code, to translate code, to read back the code. Yeah, it's great for that. And the more sort of common application is just content creation. Who use it to write emails? Who use it to write uh, the occasional meetup uh, invitation? <laughs> Not this one, by the way. This one was, was all free. This one was free, free, freehand. Um, now, let's move up. Let's move up the, the food chain. Um, so there's a research system because with uh, uh, particularly with Code Explorer um, that's a perfectly valid use of the tool or as a personal assistant I think the whole the whole remote personal assistant industry is under threat um, who uses it to learn stuff who uses it as a tutor just to learn stuff so this goes back to the oracle thing at what point does an oracle stop being an oracle and become a teacher um who uses it as a professional reviewer? I mean, this goes back to the whole legal, medical, accounting thing. I mean, you can you can ask it, you can get a very cheap, however imperfect opinion on on professional matters. Shouldn't be the shouldn't be the last one you look at. Shouldn't be the definitive one, but it's certainly one you didn't have access to before. It certainly gives you a starting point for seeing what some of the issues may be, even though it might not be the one that gives you the the the, the final conclusion you want. I'm not recommending you use AI or as an alternative to human professionals, at least not yet. Um, so who uses it as a brainstorming partner? And I guess this is where it gets important. Who uses it 
in the way that you might have used an Upworker three years ago. So, because I've reached the point where my interactions with AI, frustrating and limited as they are, if we're dealing with something that goes off on tangents, has poor memory, and hallucinates, which is a lot like some of the Upworkers I've worked with, to be honest. Um, or even a scale junior employee. So not even an Upworker, but someone you work with much more closely. Because, uh, yeah, that's beginning to happen as well. So, a bit of a summary. Where are we at? So maybe, maybe AIs have something vital in common with people, the way other things don't have, and certainly the way other technology doesn't have something in common with people. And maybe AIs are correctly managed like imperfect people. And by the way, has anybody come across perfect people? Um, so, um, well, and therefore, maybe AIs have a human-like user interface. And maybe AIs are imperfect, but they're imperfect in a way very similar to people. And they fail like people. And maybe in having as our definitive practice as working humans interaction with these AIs. So we still have a role, but it's, so it's one thing to say humans have no more role in society, but here's another distinction. Here's a world where nothing's changed. Here's a world where we're completely replaced, right? Here's a world where something's changed and there are still things just humans do, right? Okay, now let's split that middle world into two. Let's take that thing where there's still some things where that only humans do, but there are two kinds of that. One is the world where there are still things that only humans do that have nothing to do with AI. And the other one is everything involves AI. Everything. And everything humans do involves AI, but humans are in the loop. Yeah? Now, which is, which is the world we're heading into? I don't know, but I think that's an important distinction. If there's still something left for humans to do, will it be independent of AI? Um, consider that. Um, and if everything left to do involves AI, or much of what is left involves AI, that means I would suggest that everybody needs to do the thing I was talking about for a long time back in the pre-AI age with machine learning, which is people need to be more less like builders and more like explorers. I think we, ha we have a growing need for people to, to iterate, to, to deal with imperfect information, to take risks much more than they're willing to and much more than IT professionals don't mind, are certainly willing to. Um, so this is ushering in the age of the researcher versus the engineer. Um, and maybe AIs may be able to cross any moat humans have. We'll see. Um, now, maybe AIs have one important difference with people. One important qualitative difference with people. I did mention it earlier in the talk. Maybe you remember what it is. And maybe I can do another talk on it. And maybe you can tell me if that's interesting. So, questions. Um, I am happy to discuss any of this at length with anybody who's genuinely interested in the topic and less interested in being heard by this audience. By the way, I'm very happy to have people heard by this audience. That's called being a presenter. No, I'm not doing questions for me. That's the point. Uh, <laughs> you can make your statements in a minute, yes. Yeah. You can make your statements later. The point is I'm not answering questions here. If you want to talk to me and have a chat, fantastic. If you want to, if you want to talk to the audience, fantastic. We're not doing both. Um, so, uh, but if you want to reach out, if you want these slides, um, if you want these slides, like it really matters to you, like I'm keen to know to whom this really matters. And if it really matters to you, you'll reach out to me. If it doesn't, didn't really matter, well, it didn't really matter. Um, those are my contact details. That's a cat. Um, so yeah, keen for your questions, keen for your suggestions. Um, ask me for slides. Uh, you know how to find me. Uh, thank you very much.